D-Day veterans Bill Dunn, Tony Younger and a tank codenamed One Charlie. Well, our class, a tank crew, is a family. Um, to me, my crew was closer to me than my brother because you worked together, you slept together, you went out together and you did everything together. The comradeship you build up when you have to go through something like this is something which is uh, extremely valuable very deep, and I wouldn't have missed it for anything. One Charlie was designed to breach Hitler's fortress Europe. Fifty years ago, this was an important link in the chain of steel and concrete the Germans built along the entire coastline of Western Europe to repel the long-awaited Allied invasion. Expecting invasion at any moment, Field Marshal Rommel, Nazi Germany's best-known battlefield commander, was busy supervising the construction of Hitler's Atlantic Wall. For D-Day to succeed, the Allies had to penetrate these concrete and steel defences. The British came up with many ideas, including this weird demolition device called the Great Panjandrum. It was designed by novelist Neville Shute to destroy German bunkers. Captain Mike Ward-Walters took part in testing it on Devonshire beaches in 1943. I had a dog called Aminal, which was um, an explosive. It was, it was completely untrained, but a very, very nice and a very, very nicely coloured um, Airedale Terrier. As it came thundering through the surf at Insto, rather like the Jabberwock with eyes of flame, Amal decided he'd better go and meet it because he didn't approve very much. So he met it right upon the panjandrum promptly collapsed. And you'll see much to Amal's enjoyment. And then he started chasing the rockets which had broken loose from a machine and they chased him around and he chased those about. And in the end of the day, Neville Shute said that the whole thing would have been all right if it hadn't been for Aminal. Neville Shute never did get the great panjandrum to work. It was scrapped. Instead, the British concentrated on developing tanks like one Charlie that could cross ditches by dropping into them big bundles similar to wooden garden fencing, as well as throwing high explosive bombs. Then there was a bridge layer that could span ditches or streams and a track layer that spread a canvas carpet which could take the weight of a tank crossing a muddy beach. To detonate mines, tanks were fitted with chains to beat the ground. Training in all these new weapons in the months before D-Day was hectic. Not everybody was happy to convert to the Funnies, the nickname given to these strange-looking machines, as Ian Hamilton remembers. I didn't join them until September 43, when they'd already trained as cruiser tanks and they were all raring to go scorching across the French countryside or wherever we were sent. And uh, then when General Hobart, who commanded 79th Armoured Division, called on us one day at Stowe on the Wold, he dropped a bomb in our midst which was to tell us that we would not be going screaming across the countryside, but we were going to be mine-clearing uh, flail tanks, which we'd never heard of. The bottom fell out of the regiment, I think, at that point. Uh, the thought of travelling at one and a half miles an hour through a minefield, which is put there specifically to uh, enable enemy anti-tank gunners to more easily engage a target, that is not a very happy-making thought. Ian Hamilton's regiment trained for D-Day in the Cotswolds. The only level ground in Stowe in the world was the cricket pitch. And much to the annoyance of the city fathers, I'm afraid we chewed that up rather badly. The most terrifying Allied weapon was the flame-throwing tank that could hurl napalm more than 80 yards. Codenamed Crocodile, it was top secret. Secret to the extent that the people who were trained on it in England before D-Day were kept away from the rest of the regiment. Got the shock of my life when I saw this thing and was told I was going to learn to operate it immediately. I had a week's course 
And at the end of that week, we fired. And there were people turning out in that regiment who had never seen it fired before, and this was the first time they'd ever seen it do it. If you fired it into a house, the house went on fire. If you fired it into a pillbox, say through a slot of a pillbox, it would probably destroy all the oxygen in there and it would suffocate the people in there. I think it must have been a horrible sight because you would get three or four of these monsters coming at you, shooting out this terrifying volume of flame. Uh, it would have been very hard to stay put. Nevertheless, some people did stay put. I was impressed in retrospect with the awfulness of what we were doing, and yet you cannot participate in any battle without being aware of the terrible things that happen from what I would so call conventional weapons, I mean from artillery shells, for example. But it did give me a feeling of awe, of fire in battle, and uh, I think that's something that stayed with me all my life. I'd got to the stage, and I think a lot of people have, well, we wanted to get the damn thing over, and so let's get on with it. And if this weapon system was going to help us do it, fair enough. Even with the funnies, the British dreaded attacking a heavily defended port on the French coast. The bloodletting at Dieppe had taught them that. So how were the invading Allied armies going to be supplied and reinforced? The solution was a British solution, and I'd like to emphasise it entirely from British engineers. They, clever boys, they thought up the idea, fantastic, unbelievable, that if we can't capture a port, we'll build one. We'll build one on the English shore, a hundred miles from here, we'll take it over and we'll build it. Quite a fantastic idea. Codenamed Mulberry, this floating steel and concrete harbour the size of Dover, had to cope with the waves and tides of the English Channel. In 1942, engineer Alan Beckett designed this floating steel roadway that would link the floating harbour to the shore. His boss, Colonel Everall, took a model of Beckett's design to the War Office in London. When the lid was removed, I'm afraid the paint hadn't dried sufficiently to allow the packing to be separated readily from the structure itself. And the reaction was, Everall, you've even thought of the camouflage, which um, caused a small amusement and, uh, and a lot of interest in the, in the device. And the result was, that Colonel Everall came back uh, with a success story to say, Beckett, they want six pans built now. By early 1944, 40,000 men and women were working on Mulberry. They didn't know what it was for. Even the army was kept in the dark. The main assembly was similar to a Meccano set, fitting the girders to the pontoon, cables, nuts and bolts. The rumor kept going around, what on earth is it for? None of us sappers had no idea, really. Security was very tight. Orders went up on the notice board from our commanding officer that no man in any way would go around telling anybody outside what this project was all about. Despite the secrecy, a team to assemble Mulberry had to be recruited. Brigadier Mervyn Walter was the man in charge. An edict went out to all Royal Engineer units to say that, especially we lightheartedly say, brave and good men would be uh, required, one or two, two or three, for a special operation not to be mentioned, and would they send their best and bravest? Well, as you know the way the army works, that was the opportunity to, for every unit to get rid of its worst men. When we sailed on D-Day, we had 14 courts martial pending. Able seaman Kenneth Bungard joined Mulberry after he too had got into trouble. I was what's known as a defaulter in the Navy. I was adrift getting back to Chatham Barracks because uh, I'd been with my girlfriend, who is now my wife. And uh, I was in captain's report. And I wanted to get out of this. And when they asked for volunteers, I went as fast as I could to volunteer for something called party pun and party game. We were immediately piled into a lorry and taken somewhere in the Thames estuary where we came across what I thought was an office block with no windows or doors. And we were told to clamber up the iron ladder at the end onto the top. 
it was a flat piece of concrete at one end. And we were more or less on that all the time. How did you feel about being part of that team? Well, in many ways, quite proud. And um, strangely enough, I was an able seaman. And yet on that Phoenix, I was the captain, which suited me extremely well. As D-Day neared, more and more people learned the date and place of the invasion. Mervyn Walter carried that information in his briefcase. One day after a series of morning, tedious morning meetings, I went with uh, Captain Petrie, my opposite number. He took me to lunch at the in and out in Piccadilly. And as was the custom in there, you took your black bags safely locked and you put them under the table when you had your lunch. Well, when we got back to Norfolk House, which was just literally around the corner, I found that I'd left my bag under the table. I got onto the phone, and I shall never forget the calm voice of the hall porter saying, yes, sir, a bag was found under one of these tables, and I have it safe here in my lobby. Well, I raced to the tub, found the bag. It was as far as that one could make out, unopened. Well, I brought it back and checked the papers, reported to intelligence, expecting at least to be sent to the tower and executed, and rather hoping I would because the strain was so great. In my bag were plans which, if found by the Germans, would have disclosed where we were going to have the invasion. Secrecy was paramount even when briefing the soldiers, as trooper Jack Thornton recalls. They took us to a cinema in Keithley, heavily guarded. We had to identify the men, one on each side of us, make sure that we knew him. And then uh, they came on and told us that we were going to be in the sharp end and we were going to be training on a secret weapon. The secret weapon was the duplex drive, or DD, floating tank. How did it work? If you get a heavy stone and put it in a canvas bucket and put that canvas bucket in the water, the canvas bucket will go down a bit, but it will float. So what they did with the tank is they built round it a canvas bucket. In other words, they put a screen all round the tank which could be inflated, and when that screen stood up, the tank will float in the water. It looked like a, a knock-together Meccano outfit. It looked so crude, but it worked. We could send up the screen and the tank floated. We were amazed. And then, of course, it became a lark. We, we played at it then for a time. We all had a good time. It was all fun. The fun ended just two months before D-Day when Jack Thornton's squadron were sent to Studland Bay in Dorset. On April 4th, 1944, they went on a night exercise. Within minutes, out of nowhere, a storm suddenly sprang up and the waves got bigger and bigger. And as they got bigger, they started to slop over the screen into the tank. Gradually, we were sinking. As the water rose up to my waist, I thought we were going down, so I was prepared to do that. So I started to put the escape apparatus on. I was breathing oxygen for most of my time coming in. I was ready to sink. I hit the beach here, luckily. I deflated the screen. I hopped out of the tank onto the beach. I looked behind, and there was no one following me. That should have been the, the tanks had disappeared that were behind me. That's the first inkling I had. But before I could do anything, the CO drove past along the beach in a jeep and told my sergeant, who was up in the turret, to put me on a charge for not wearing a steel helmet. Well, for some reason, I was the leading tank and I made it. The two tanks behind didn't. They went down. My friends were out there and it hit me hard, very hard. My particular friend was uh, Corporal Park. His wife, at the time, lived in Lancaster. Well, I was given the task of sorting out his, all his possessions and bundling them up. I was put on a train to Lancaster and I had to tell her that her husband was dead, drowned, but not how he'd drowned. I couldn't tell her that he was in a DD tank that had gone down. That was still a secret. All I could tell her was that, I'm sorry, Arthur is dead. He's been drowned on an exercise. And that was it. Five of Jack's comrades died on the night of April 4th, 1944. Several of their tanks still lie at the bottom of Studland Bay.
At dawn on June 6, 1944, Allied troops landed on the beaches of Normandy. In every sector where they swam ashore, the DD tanks took the German defences completely by surprise. Landing with the Canadians at Grey sur Mer were Major Tony Younger and Bill Dunn, driver of One Charlie. Could their funnies breach Hitler's Atlantic Wall? We landed, and this, where we're sitting, was um, one of the gaps which I had planned. We had known that there would probably be anti-tank mines, and there were, and I had flail tanks with me, and they were stuck in the minefield. I followed a flail. Flail tank was in front of me, and he was clearing the mines all along the beach and up to where we were supposed to go to. And then, unfortunately, uh, he got onto one under his tracks and blew his truck one truck off. So I had to push past him and get to where, in my mind, where this culvert was, because we'd had so much training, and the picture of the culvert was in our minds exactly where it should be. And I stopped, and I told the uh, my sergeant, who was tank commander, Jim Ashton, that I couldn't see the culvert. Here was the only route off the beach, and there was the most enormous crater, something like 66 feet across, full of water, which is a problem for getting tanks through. The order we got was carry on. So I just put my tank in the first gear, and I didn't move the yard, and it went straight down into the culvert. Because we couldn't see it for water, because it was all this area was all covered with water. The Germans had flooded the area. He then realised that this was very deep, and then the water started to come in, and so they jumped out of the tank, and they came, they ran for cover down here. As we laid down, my sergeant started to sing, which he always did when the try and keep was happy, and uh, because I was the youngest one of the crew, and he was more or less the father figure. What was he singing? Kiss Me Again, De Deanna Durban's song. And uh, he sang this, and just got to start to sing it nicely when the motor bombs dropped between us. My arm was shattered, both legs were shattered, and, and I had spinal injuries. And I started to run from the minefield, and the doctors wouldn't believe me that I'd run about 40 to 50 yards because I had five compound fractures in my leg. There was a lance corporal and a sergeant came and dragged me back, further back towards the beach. And uh, I lay there, for, they left me there. And I asked them about uh, the rest of the crew, and they said they didn't they want to chew her, didn't want to tell me that they were dead. All that I felt was that we've got to do this job as quickly as possible, because the longer we uh, take to do it, the more danger there is for the men. Bill Dunn's tank, One Charlie, had a final duty to perform. We decided the only thing to do was to get another tank up and push the tank into the crater and then drop one of our salt bridges from this side onto the turret of the tank and make a very sort of hotchpotch crossing, but something we could get one of our tanks over for a start. That day, Bill Dunn lost an arm and four comrades. But one Charlie had done its job. For the next three decades, it would lie forgotten, buried under the road, just behind the beach at Grey sur Mer. But the greatest losses on D-Day were suffered on Omaha Beach by the Americans, who'd rejected the British offer of tanks like One Charlie. They lost 2,000 men and were nearly driven into the sea. The following day, Brigadier Mervyn Walter found himself near Omaha Beach, waiting to go ashore. We'd planned for months, planned this and planned that, but I never thought of how I was to come ashore from HMS Aristocrat, where I was with Captain Petrie. But a, a duck floated past us with two dead Americans in it, and they made fast the duck, and I thought, here's the answer, I can go ashore dry. The duck was an American invention based on the standard US Army two-and-a-half-ton truck. The one thing that hadn't been visualised when they were planning way back in 42 was that given sheltered water by having breakwaters, the value of the ducks, the ducks were one of the pieces of equipment of the Second World War, like the Dakota 
and like the uh, jeep that whose potential wasn't fully realised until the war showed what good equipment it was. The Royal Navy had the job of towing the Mulberry Harbour across the Channel. Kenneth Bungard arrived at Armanche on board his concrete caisson, codenamed Phoenix. We were 60 foot up on a piece of flat concrete. We had no protection whatsoever. If we were hit by anything, it would just go down like a stone. We had no defence at all. What did you see when you got to Armanche? The first thing I noticed was a few bodies floating by. And then looking out a bit further, I saw an RAF rescue launch, and there were two men on there with boat hooks pulling bodies out and piling them up on the back of the boat, and they were piled high. I'd never seen so many bodies in all my life. It was rather frightening, actually. Once in position, the Phoenix caissons were scuttled to form a huge breakwater off Aramanche. The 1,200 sappers under Mervyn Walter's command could now begin their task of assembling Mulberry's floating roadways and piers. Somewhere about D plus five, all of us looking back on it can remember that uh, something came over us, the sight of these big caissons uh, and these pier heads coming out and these tall, tall 90-foot masts on the quays somehow inspired all these goons, as they were known as, to do their absolute utter damnedest to win. And to me, the lesson of it was, and a lesson which I've never forgotten, all the equipment, all the training, all the technical skill that you get don't add up to anything compared to morale. Well, it was an experience of a lifetime for any engineer to have a, a, a realisation of one of his rather harebrained concepts. To see it actually happen on a major scale, it, it, it's an occasion of joy. It made it possible to, for us to get in the, the necessary backup of material to follow through and relieve our own bridgehead under the pressure of the German panzer divisions. Without Mulberry, the Allies wouldn't have dared to invade France. Without D-Day, the war might have struggled on for years. The technology used for the first time in the Mulberry Harbour now allows millions of holidaymakers to cross the Channel every year. In 1976, with Bill Hawkins, the only other survivor from One Charlie, Bill Dunn returned to grey sur to see their tank lifted from its D-Day burial place. To me, it was just like having your own home resurrected after being underwater for quite a number of years. And it had brought a lump to both throats and it brought D-Day back again to seeing our own crew, the way the crew were. Seeing them, we, in fact, we saw them alive that day, as though that nothing had happened. It gives me a nice feeling to think, well, I drove this. And they're still here. It's put here to represent all the people that was killed, not just from our, our regiment, but for all of them that was killed in this particular area. Because this was a Canadian landing on this particular sector. And there was a lot of Canadians killed around here, so it's not only the 2-6 assault squadron, it's for everybody that was killed in this particular section. <laughs> 